get started in just a second. We're just going to wait for everyone else to jump in uh, into the room as we know that there's a, a waiting room function. So we want to make sure that we're not cutting off that first part of the talk um, where we say uh, hello to Martin and uh, we can make sure that everyone gets to see the whole thing and not just uh, a bit off the start. So if you do think of any questions, make sure you're sending them through as we're talking. And uh, I'm going to hand over to Martin in just a second where he's going to tell us about his uh, inspiring career story. And uh, if you've got any questions for him, make sure that you use that function Q&A feature and uh, we'll get them to Martin at the end of today's session. Martin's going to talk for about half an hour and then we're going to use uh, the last 15, 20 minutes to uh, go through uh, as many questions that you've asked as we possibly can. Right. I think we'll get underway. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, Welcome to today's session of Learn Lounge. Here at SpringPod, we're dedicated to helping young people make more informed choices when it comes to their future careers. Now, through Learn Lounge, we're bringing uh, influential speakers directly to you to share their career stories. So from tech wizards, filmmakers, entrepreneurs, and well, everything in between, uh, we've had some incredible speakers so far, like I mentioned, including football manager for QPR, Mark Warburton, uh, motivational speaker Mr. Beasy and uh, BAFTA award-winning cinematographer Sophie Darlington and many, many more. So like I said, if you miss any of those, don't worry. You can catch all the replays on demand via the Learn Lounge website and all for free. Uh, Learn Lounge is part of that mission for us. And through this, we'll be bringing some influential speakers with incredible stories right to you. Um, so Let's uh, get introducing for uh, today's session. My name's Joe. I'll be hosting today's session of Learn Lounge. Uh, just a few pointers before we start. The talk should last about 40 minutes. Please do ask questions to our guests and they'd absolutely love to answer them. Uh, remember to tag us on social media with the hashtag, hashtag Learn Lounge as well. And we're in partnership with the Children's Trust. Um, and we'll talk more about that later on. They're a fantastic charity. We'll talk to you about how you can donate as well. Um, today we're joined by inspirational business strategist and world changer Martin Sibley. Uh, despite being diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy at an early age, he never let his disability stand in his way. He's the co-founder of uh, <coughs> excuse me. He's the co-founder of Disability Horizons, and in 2016 he published his book Everything Is Possible. Now in this session, he's going to talk to us about how he overcame the challenges that his disability imposed beat the odds and achieved his dreams. And it's an absolute honor to have him here today with us. Martin, welcome to Learn Lounge. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Really excited to, to share my story and journey and uh, yeah, hopefully share some pointers and tips that resonate with people along the way as well. Fabulous. I know you've got a presentation. I'm going to hand over to you now uh, to talk to us about your uh, inspiring career story. Over to you. Sure. So you can hear and see me all right, yeah? Uh, yeah, screen's just loading. We can see and hear you just fine. Perfect. Thank you very much, Joe. So yes, uh, the, the presentation, that I've, I'm, I am a speaker in terms of I go um, around the circuit at conferences and events and do lots of keynotes and inspirational talks. And so um, the, the slides are similar to the ones I use for, for lots of those talks. And I've been calling it how to change the world for a couple of years now. And I think the first thing to mention about that is that isn't intended in some big scary way or even a slightly corny cheesy way but it's a, a truth that I've learned that when we sort of tap into our passions and the things we enjoy and the thing things that we're good at we really do have such a big impact on on the world and it you know it definitely is almost those smaller things that add up and I think that just given that context will make more sense when I start going through but I think the message to everyone watching is that we all do have a true genuine power to to change the world when we do stick to what, what we're good at and what we enjoy and we just crack on with that every day um, and another thing to mention there is the the logo is actually the United Nations logo for accessibility so uh, as you'll see I do quite a lot of work now around disability and inclusion and uh, the logo for disability has always become the wheelchair user and I am actually a wheelchair user. I rely on my wheelchair all, all the time I'm up and about in my waking hours but um, through my professional side I've learned that obviously there are lots of other types of disability so I quite like this uh, logo because it's about 
inclusion for all types of different disabled people. So growing up with a disability, my, my disability, as Joe mentioned, it's spinal muscular atrophy. Um, so that's very much a genetic thing. Um, people haven't so much heard of SMA, but it's under the umbrella of muscular dystrophy, which a few more people have, have generally heard of. Um, and it basically means practically that I've always had to use a wheelchair. Um, I've never you know, been able to walk at all. Um, I have to have quite a lot of support with care day to day. Um, so in terms of when I was a child, obviously that was my mum and dad doing lots of that support. And then at school, I had what were known as learning support assistants, LSAs, and I believe they're now now called uh, TAs, teaching assistants. But yeah, so the, the care that I needed on a physical level was provided either with my parents or um, by a couple of members of the, the staff at school. Um, I grew up in a small village in Cambridgeshire. The village was called Needingworth, which I'd be very surprised if anyone watching has heard of Needingworth, but it's, um, it's not far from Cambridge. And um, it was an inclusive school. So really, I was pretty much, I would say that the only disabled in the village is the, the Little Britain <laughs> um, <laughs> phrase goes, the, the sketch on Little Britain. Um, but yeah, but it was uh, for me, I think a good thing that I was able to do mainstream education. Obviously, my disability uh, doesn't, hasn't and doesn't affect my cognitive ability. So I was fully able to, to do the normal curriculum. Um, obviously, the school had to make sure that there were ramps and certain other adjustments to to facilitate me. Um, but yeah, I meant that I had lots of classmates that weren't disabled. And so I think um, at that period of time, it was very important to just to, to be brought up where my disability wasn't an overriding factor or too much of an identity. Um, but then conversely, when I went to secondary school, uh, the local secondary wasn't accessible for wheelchair users. So despite my parents fighting to try and uh, get ramps and lifts put in, it was just not, not possible at the time. And I'm pleased to say that school is now accessible to wheelchair users. So there was good progress in the long run. Um, but I had to go about half an hour away to, to school and I had to go on an adaptive bus with a few other students that were wheelchair users like myself. And I think as much as those earlier years were positive that I, I wasn't encompassed with disability, I think it was also really, really nice that I then got to meet other people that did understand some of the parts of life that were more challenging. Like, you know, an example would be, I've always needed help to, to go to the toilet. So um, I've always had to have that support from you know at that point parents and teaching assistants so the the other people that I went to school with that were in wheelchairs we understood some of those challenges and difficulties together and that was nice as well but the school was still inclusive in the sense that um, there was a unit for disabled students where we could have help with you know physio and uh, many other things we needed support with but then we went off to the lessons and um, within any class, it would, there wouldn't so wouldn't have been so many disabled students. So it still had that nice that nice balance and that nice mix. Um, so yeah, I think that probably covers most of the the school years. Um, and yeah, getting in terms of the wheelchair, I mentioned um, at that point there wasn't as much support with funding for things like that. So the village I grew up in were amazing. All the people helped to, to like fundraise for the wheelchairs and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it was a really, you know, you hear some quite horror stories of being disabled and, you know, struggling for equipment or being bullied because you're different. And um, whether I was lucky or whether, you know, other things were put in place to, to help. But um, yeah, really, I was always just one of the students, one of the guys, um, I used to play football with my non-disabled friends, even though I was in my wheelchair in school a few tapping goals on the, on the back post and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it was um, definitely a, a positive experience of, of growing up and having a disability. So then one of the defining moments really was um, due to SMA, I've always had to be a bit careful of the fact that my um, if I get a cold or a flu, it can become a chest infection and sometimes pneumonia. And as, so really with 
SMA, I'm physically quite weak. I need all the help we talked about before. But sort of energy and health-wise, I'm generally quite okay, apart from just managing those little winter spells with, with the cold and everything. But the one big thing was that when I had something called a scoliosis, um, I don't know if anyone will have, will have heard of that, but it's basically where your spine becomes sort of twisted and turns over, and it, um, it's quite common with uh, people that have SMA. And the main way to, to fix that is to put in growth plates, um, sorry, to put in titanium rods. And I was reading off the, the bullet points that during the operation, they had to take out my growth plates so that I've still got two very big titanium rods. So my, my theme tune is um, I Am Titanium. It's a song we all may know. <laughs> Good I don't choice. generally play it around when I'm going anywhere, but you know, it, it's sometimes in the back of my head. Um, but so that meant that I, I was put much more upright um, and that meant that when I was to get those colds and coughs, I was more able to, to breathe and just to be uh, more healthy and less risk of the pneumonia. But you can imagine the operation was was pretty bad. Um, it was two operations a week apart, um, about eight hours each operation. And um, I think I, I like to, to bring it up because, you know, for me, we all have challenges and some are not maybe as severe or, or as physically painful and, and, and big as the operation I'm describing. But, you know, even the, the much smaller challenges that we all face, that they are quite defining in our growth and our development. And, you know, I could have just wanted to give up on school. Um, you know, I, I not only had a long recovery from the operation itself, but I lost a lot of weight um, due to the, the trauma, I think, of the operation. I had panic attacks and anxiety attacks for about a year afterwards and so really it was just that kind of thing that I could have just given up and not wanted to strive for more but um, I, I had the attitude that while I was in the hospital I was going to you know dream up all the the things I wanted to do maybe not immediately when I got out of the hospital but certainly you know once I was recovered and once I was a bit older and we'll come on to some of those dreams come true soon um, but it was a matter of just dreaming big and having something positive to to work towards. Um, and yeah, I think just that there's that mantra of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And it as horrible and testing it was, it definitely you know gave me some nice dreams and things to strive forward for. So then moving on to independence and freedom, the photo there is me with my adapted vehicle. So you can see I'm driving a car just with my hands and I learned to do that when I was at university when I was about 19 years old and I'm, I've always done that from my wheelchair so I've always had a ramp to get in a bigger vehicle and then all sorts of buttons and you know kind of a space station type um, adaptations to, to be able to control the vehicle and I've not only driven around when I was going to uni and back and then when I was living in London and working but I also um, later on, it will come again on too soon, but I've driven quite a lot around Europe as well. So the, the car definitely represents independence and freedom, but um, it's also a metaphor because when you have a disability, um, particularly one that very like my one, um, these are four areas that have been very crucial to being independent and that's having the care. So when I went to university to study economics and, and I did a, masters in marketing the biggest hurdle was not so much getting in I, I got you know average a level results but it was having um the the housing which we've got there the third bullet point uh the halls being adapted for for what i needed uh you know wheelchair accessible wet room shower that kind of stuff um but also having a, a team of people that could support me with my care and it was pretty liberating because Although I'd started going out and partying with friends while I was doing my A-levels, I still had to rely on mum and dad to, to put me to bed and help me get to bed when I got home. And I think most, um, you know, 18, 19 year olds, obviously once we're old enough to, to have a drink. So for the younger ones, this is something you're going to have to wait a while for. But, it, you know, we all feel that sort of restriction of, oh, I've got to be home when my parents want me to be home. But for me, it was fundamental because I had to have their assistance to, to go to bed. 
Um, and it wasn't just about the partying, it was also just everything. I had to rely on more what my mum and dad's schedule were. So being able to have a care team at uni meant I could get up when I wanted to and I could prepare meals with the support of my team. And I, as we said, I could go out and have some fun of an evening as well. So that was really um, a big part of being more independent and everything. Equipment, um, that's I have to have a thing called a hoist that lifts me, uh, like physically lifts me out of my wheelchair and into bed or into the, the shower. So equipment has been fundamental. And uh, we mentioned transport, um, and I mentioned the car rather, but with transport, that's also buses and trains. And, you know, imagine for me, I need to have ramps to, to get on them and I need, um, you know, certain members of staff to be uh, trained and open and welcoming, which we'll come a bit more onto in a moment. But yeah, so I think just to, to recap, um, the, the health side has always been a factor for me. But as long as I've managed the health, then I'm I'm able to to crack on health ways. Now we've touched independence, which was very much these these four areas. And I still obviously have to manage health and manage my independent living even today to to be able to do the things that I do. And then I suppose you could say they're like my foundations. But I would also say anyone watching that's not got a disability, we all have to look after our health, you know, sleep well, eat well, get exercise. It's similar in terms of just managing our health. And, you know, with independence, it's just about um, the foundations, really, just having the basics and the skills and everything. But in terms of inclusion, and particularly when you're looking at this from a, a disability perspective, um, I was taught something when I got my first job out of uni with the disability charity Scope, and it's all about the social model. And in a nutshell, it means that I have a medical condition called spinal muscular atrophy, and we've dealt with, we've talked about all that already. But for me to be able to work and travel and study and all the things out in society, it's more about the barriers that are in society that I have to overcome. So if you think, we've talked a couple of times about steps or ramps and lifts, so on a, a physical environmental level, when buildings and transport have ramps and lifts, I'm not really disabled because I've got my wheelchair. I'm, I'm very able. I'm just Martin. But when there are steps to get in, I, I can't physically go. Um, so in a business level, that also means that, you know, if there's a restaurant and I can't get in, I won't go with any of my friends or family either because I'm I'm disabled from entering that restaurant. But so therefore, so will the other people that want to have a nice meal with me. So um, one part of the social model is basically about the barriers in a physical sense, but some other barriers are around the attitudes of people. So quite often, you know, people will see me in a wheelchair and they'll presume that I'm I'm not as cognitively able or I'm not able to speak for myself. And so that that's a barrier to me being able to achieve my full potential and you know some of the things that I've generally had to overcome through my life. But on those other two points, we've got self-esteem and confidence and skills and knowledge. And I think any person with a disability, they are so crucial to overcoming those social model barriers. So when we feel more self-worth that we are um, enough and that, you know, that the problem isn't that we're born with or how, like some disabled people become disabled later from an accident or whatever, whatever other many, many causes there are, but essentially it's not anyone's fault they have a disability. Um, and I think also when we look at diversity and inclusion and protected identities, um, like the gay community and under race and religion as well, like it's in the end, it's all difference. And I think that all of our differences are positive and, and really beautiful, but where parts of society um, are just not sure and how to cope with difference we have to educate that and the more we calmly and confidently educate very quickly people get over those negative views and stereotypes so yeah I think that the key for inclusion is understanding why people are a bit negative or discriminating and obviously not everybody is um, but to use the, those other two points as the sort of uh, tools or the keys for for inclusion so yeah, with, with health and independence and the framework of, of how to overcome 
barriers and specifically looking at my story of being a wheelchair user the the world is all of our oyster and in this case it was very much um my oyster so that that picture there is from me in australia um it was the summer between my bachelor's degree and when i started my masters and i went to sydney melbourne and a place near brisbane and i arranged two care assistants that came with me and i so you know i have a funding uh, pot from the local um, social services that enable me to employ and have my own team of of carers wherever i want to you know whatever i want to do so not just when to get out of bed and have food but another thing i've been breaking barriers down is that you know disabled people travel too so <laughs> sort of looking at how that that became more possible as well so the the trip to australia was phenomenal um really nice kind of thing to do um while i was still at, at uni and be away for nearly a month because i stopped off at singapore on both uh, flights to and from australia that's in san francisco in california uh, with a friend of mine who also has sma um so we were there by the golden gate bridge we were both still working in our day jobs at that point um but during that trip we came up with an idea that later became a business that we co-founded so um i think another point is that you know travel is such a beautiful way of opening our horizons and understanding different cultures and how we really are all different in many ways in the world but equally we're all joined by the fact that that we're human and we're not actually so different underneath all of that um and so travel was very powerful for me to do that i appreciate at the moment um travel's not so possible but i i know that covid-19 is going to pass eventually even if it is going to take a a year or so to really get back to some sort of normality but i just want to make that point that once it's all possible i i think particularly um around that sort of a level degree period it, it is worth having it doesn't have to even be a whole gap year but just some period of travel is just really powerful in terms of building up yourself for the future and thinking about careers as well So that's me in in Barcelona. As I say, this is just where I show off a bit with my holiday photos. <laughs> um, Barcelona is a very accessible place. Uh, the eighty percent of the metro, the underground, is accessible. Whereas in London, only one third of the stations are wheelchair accessible. So, having lived in London and worked there for five years, and when I finally you know did some trips and some work in Barcelona, it was quite. liberating again to use that word that i could actually just get on most of the in the stations and on the underground trains to just to move around more freely really so that's my fiance kasha on the right in fact i'm was due to get married at the end of this month in poland where kasha's originally from but um with all the covid-19 stuff we've had to to put back the stag do and the hen do and oh. the the wedding so you know there's there's worse things going on and we're quite um stoic about the fact that we'll we'll get there in the end but um yeah so that that's my little love story on a tangent with Kasha <laughs> who I've been together with over 7 years now uh, but that pictures in Tokyo um and the guy on the left was an old school friend that was only in England for a year but then when I took this trip and it was like a young leaders program from the japanese government um we we got to catch up with haruka i think the first time i'd seen him in like 20 years um so it was great to to see japan so it went to tokyo and hiroshima did lots of interesting work around inclusive government policy uh but yeah got to do a bit of tourism and and catch up with an old friend as well um i won't show the video but um that was when i did some adaptive skiing so if anyone wants to check out afterwards if you go to youtube and type my name and catalan adapted skiing or something like that you'll get this video um and it was um i gave a talk um similar to the one we're doing here really when i was in barcelona on the united nations day for disabled people a few years ago and someone said oh you've done all this cool stuff what what would you still want to do I said well I've always fancied adapted skiing but it's never happened and then the guy said right there'll be a taxi there tomorrow morning to take you off up the mountain and we're going to make it happen um no way. I'll put a bit more context in a minute 
as to sort of why I've been doing the work <clears> I do and why that was more possible. Uh, but yeah, in terms of travels and adventure, that was definitely up there with some of the cool stuff. Um, that was when I flew an adapted plane over Stonehenge and the, the smile is more relief of landing, I think, as much as uh, <laughs> a general happiness, but it was a pretty cool experience. Um, that was again in Catalonia where I made a video for the tourist board. That's why there's a camera guy filming me. And we were up in the air at 7 a.m. because you sort of do the hot air balloon quite early in the morning. We had this spanning views over Barcelona and Catalonia. And uh, this was tree climbing. That was a bit of a weird one, actually. The 130 kilogram wheelchair plus me just hanging from a tree. <laughs> but um, it was a part of a, a work project as well. So when I say giving back, I mean, for me, all of my work is is still tied up in around giving value and giving back to other people. But equally, they are all my job and my career. And I've, you know, I make a living out of it. But it's, I've been, you know, partly lucky, but partly um, strategic and thoughtful about what I wanted to do a long time ago. So I always knew that I wanted to work in sort of media and inclusion and travel and business. And really, it all started with my blog, martinsibley.com, where I just was 2009, uh, mid-20s, living in London. And I just started telling my story through articles, pictures, video blogs. And, you know, people just resonated with disabled people and non-disabled people alike. Um, and I think that's what got things moving. So I... In 2011, soon after the San Francisco photo, Shrin and I founded Disability Horizons magazine, which is disabilityhorizons.com. Um, we're still going strong. Um, so we started out with a basic website and a couple of articles that me and Shrin wrote. And it was just, again, about the, the experience and giving a voice to people with disabilities. Um, but very quickly, we got more writers, we got more readers. We started to get sponsors and, yeah, the magazine and the community just grew and grew. And then from that, we then, for, look, because of the lot of travels, as you've just seen that I did, we saw problems around accommodation when traveling, particularly in a wheelchair. And so Accommable was founded, which we said was the Airbnb for disabled people. Um, so we got uh, properties that we vetted as being different levels of accessibility we then got disabled people coming on the website, looking to go on where to go on holiday. Um, we got investment, so it was a proper business with entrepreneurial fundraising and all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, we, we ended up selling that two and a bit years ago to Airbnb. So it was quite a, a cool thing that, you know, when you put an idea out there, like we said, oh, it's the Airbnb for disabled people. You never quite know what's going to come back <laughs> out of that. Um, and then, yeah, so sort of during and after that, I've been a consultant around inclusion and particularly influencer and social media marketing. Um, so consulting for governments, business and charities. I've been voted twice in Britain's top five most influential disabled people. And the thing that I actually need to add it as a bullet point, but literally a couple of weeks ago, I co-founded an influencer marketing agency called Purple Goat. And what we're trying to do is say to businesses who have still not really been good enough about accessibility of goods and services, employing disabled people and having inclusive marketing, is that it's not about charity um, and it's not about pity. Um, and it's, you know, obviously there are disabled people that do rely on benefits and welfare. And we absolutely want the government to keep doing those things because they're vital. But there are lots of disabled people that that work like I work and they travel like I travel, but the businesses just aren't accessible enough. Um, and when you know that there's 1.3 billion disabled people in the world, and that's 14 million in the UK, that's $8 trillion of spending power per year globally. That And in the UK, that's £250 billion per year. So we're basically helping businesses to be more inclusive and use influencer marketing and social marketing, you know, social media marketing 
um, as a way of, of bringing that all together. And there was another stat that 0.06% of adverts have disability, even though 20% of the population has a disability. So that's my latest venture and we're, you know, week two, week three on that at the, at the moment. Um, so just in you know, terms of like what I think my superpowers are, are things like, you know, sort of being visionary of what the world could look like, daily habits. I did a thing on BBC about my daily habits of being productive and effective. I've always learned from role models, whether they're disabled or just entrepreneurs. I've found role models are so important, uh, digital storytelling and, yeah, a couple more there. But I think also for everyone watching, it's, you know, to have that ponder yourself, what are your inclusion superpowers? And it comes back to what I said at the beginning, that if you just think about the things that you enjoy doing, not thinking about work and careers, there's very often ways of um, having a job in that. Like, for example, I used to love playing on my PlayStation, uh, particularly on FIFA. We used to have tournaments at uni, and I haven't played on it for like 10 years because I've been quite busy, as you can see. But <laughs> also, I was like, oh, you know, it's not really the dumb thing when you're older to play on gaming and stuff. And then the last year or two, I've realized there's um, platforms coming up with people of all ages that are competing or just having fun on games but also as it becomes with influencer marketing and social media marketing there are people that do you know content creation blogging jobs for gaming companies and there are influencers that get to try out the latest games and they're you know they're adults and it's their job so I really think be aware of what you love and what you're good at and I'd also say you might not get there in a day, a month, or a year. I graduated in 2006, so this has been 14 years of dead ends and just building up experience and knowledge. And I also would say when you're starting out, the internships and work experience and volunteering is really important. So even when I was doing my A-levels, let alone my uh, degree, um, I was fortunate that I had a bit of a disability benefit uh, for, for income but it, the reason was I couldn't do a bar job like a lot of students you know would would typically have a sort of bar job but either way I still went and did summer jobs that I didn't get paid for just so I could learn about you know what what different businesses needed from employees and to build up skills and and also network having a really good network of people is very often useful when you then start to work out what you want to do so a bit of a like quick fire lots of thoughts and and tips but as joe said you know if people have got other questions afterwards feel free to to ask a bit more and i'm happy to you know to share and obviously we've got the q a now anyway to go in a little bit more depth but that that's the end of my uh, slide presentation and thank you for listening martin thank you so so much honestly i'm um it's so impressive I mean, you've traveled more than I have, you know, <laughs> like, and I think the the one question I want to ask, for example, I know you mentioned about um, adverts, for example, and it was what, 0.06%, did you say? Yeah. Yeah. How do you get away from that feeling of tokenism? Because, you know, I mean, I feel the same way about the gay community and, you know, I saw something about Netflix the other day, just putting gay characters and everything. Yeah. And I can't get away from feeling that that is that they're just doing it for the sake of it. How do you feel about that? Well, the the business reason is clear that if you know if you have a group of people that are basically customers, like if I see an advert that has a wheelchair user in the right way, I'm gonna that resonates, and I'm like, oh yeah, I I can connect and link and you know feel part of of what that is. I think where it's tokenistic and where it goes wrong and brands get into trouble is when it, it's not been done with the community. So it, it will all mind. There's a guy I spoke to that's um, they're trying to test adverts with different community groups. So it's like instead of the brand almost in the ivory tower saying, let's have a gay character or a wheelchair user character yeah. on Netflix or in an advert. And, you know, that's probably what they 
have as their day-to-day -day life that's where it jars and it doesn't work but if you actually you know talk about real challenges or just real experiences I think that authenticity comes through and it will work. Um, how do you persevere through negativity or adversity that you must feel? Because I mean, we know that you have, um, sure. obviously from getting to where, you, to where you are now and to be able to do all the things that you have done. How, what, what sort of things were you telling yourself, you know, to get, to get through it? Well, I think the first point is to say that, you know, some days are just bad. And I think I've learned it's a human trait, you know, there are, there are cycles, like we're just a bit tired or our mood is just a bit lower. And I think it's almost to let go and just accept that maybe that day is better just to take a bit of time out and yeah, watch a bit of Netflix or just go for a longer walk outside. So I think that there's something on those, those sort of moments that we all have bad days and that's not a bad thing. Um, when there's something more, you know, more specific, more more particular adversity, I think um, having something to aim for helps because you, you've sort of got that, you know, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, that, that light at the end of the tunnel sort of thing. Um, but, yeah, I mean, some other tips and thoughts, I suppose, is being surrounded by supportive people that you can talk it through with, um, knowing yourself what, what helps cheer you up a bit and what, you know, how to switch off from worrying. Um, and I have to say like two, three years ago, um, I burned out a bit with the accommodable business. I just overdid it. Um, and so I did get more into mindfulness and meditation and looking a bit more at my, my diet because, you know, again, it's dis disabled or not, as I said earlier, you know, we just have to look after our body. And when I was in my twenties, I could, do all the sort of fast food and partying and it didn't matter and it it caught up a bit more in my 30s and I'm not saying that in like a over the hill way but just uh you know like I think we have chapters and lifestyles change a bit and our you know what we want to do changes a bit so yeah I think there is a bit about uh self-care you know sleeping and diet and things like that so there isn't one thing and it will be different for everybody but th those are a few of the things. And I mentioned the BBC piece. It was on BBC Ideas and it was about daily habits. So there was a few of those sort of habits I've just mentioned that were, were in that piece if people want to watch that as well. Um, Guest69 has said, oh, sorry, I've got my glasses on, I can't see a thing. Uh, it's great to know that you haven't let your disability deter you from achieving things in life, but not everyone has that kind of support. What do you think needs to change with our general approach to disability? Well, I mean, it's, it's all parts of society. So overall, the narrative needs to change because I think those that just feel like it's too hard with a disability, we're, we're all constantly fed narratives and stories without even realising if you, you know, you mentioned Netflix, it's like whatever the 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 character and the story of a disabled character is like that starts to just put out what the reality is or maybe isn't of disability and I think in the media it's either been triumph over tragedy so it's like I I'm proud of the things I did and I did them because I wanted to for me but I, even I have to be careful of carrying on that thing about you know it's not just about being disabled and climbing mountains it's about having a job, having relationships, going on holidays and not always the extreme stuff. And like I also mentioned, there's a lot talked about welfare and benefits. And so I think we've got these two polar opposite narratives that you're either the, the superhuman Paralympian or you're the, the you know benefit street sort of scrounger type thing. Um, and the truth is there's a whole load in the middle there. And so I think most of all, we need to change the narrative about disability in that way. But it's also that the government have to see disability as if you invest in, for, particularly with someone like me with a physical disability, if I've got a wheelchair and the adapted car, you've just seen all the amazing things that I could do, but not just for me, but, you know, I've created jobs and I pay tax. So it's like, 
on an economic level, if you invest in the independence and inclusion, you end up with a lot more benefits as a society and as an mm-hmm. economy anyway. Um, so the government needs to see it more as an investment rather than a burden or a cost. Um, so there's a governmental change. And then I think on a business level, we talked <clears> about a bit when I mentioned that Purple Goat, the name of the agency I'm now running, um, it's just about getting them to, to employ more disabled people and to have accessible goods and services and that kind of stuff. So once all of that, and it has got better. I mean, in my lifetime, it's immensely better than it was, you know, decades ago. And even the last 10 years, there's things improving. But I do feel it's just a bit more around that that narrative is where that's why people just feel it's too difficult and too hard because they're just fighting this uphill uphill battle. And I'd also just like to say that people without a disability have that feeling that life is too much and and too difficult. So I would also offer the point that disabled or not, we're all born with different personality traits as well. So it it's hard to just say it's this and that's the answer. It, there's lots of different considerations, but yeah, there's a few thoughts I've got on that question anyway. You've done so much. What out of all of those things, if you had to pick, I, I don't like making people pick, but what are you most proud of in everything that you've done? So getting going to uni on the independent living level was really a big step. As I said, it was quite hard to leave home and have strangers do very um, intimate, helpful tasks. So that was a big step. Um, Australia was the first big travel, so that was definitely one. Um, yeah, all the adventures were cool. And our entrepreneurially, I suppose, the, the Airbnb acquisition of the business was cool. And what are three words that you would use to describe yourself? Guest 975 has asked that. Three words. Yeah, three words you use to describe yourself. Great question, hard to answer. Um, <laughs> positive, optimistic, mm-hmm. can do. They are, I'm, I'm, I'll give you that last one. We'll say it's got a hyphen in between can do. <laughs> um, and uh, guest 316 has asked, uh, we've got time for one or two more questions. Um, so that you've traveled quite a lot. It's fantastic to see that you've never let SMA deter you. Uh, when traveling, do you look for destinations or locations that are more inclusive or do you just go with a destination or activity that you just want to do? Yeah, so uh, I, ideally it would be the latter. It's like there's places I still want to go to that I've not yet been to because there are a lot of difficulties. And I, and I would, as a general point, say that more developed countries are more accessible and inclusive and you know, for obvious economic reasons, but it is harder to have access to transport and buildings um, in in some of the less developed countries. Um, so I think that there is unfortunately still that that element. Um, but you know, there's still some stuff I've done off the beaten track when I was been on sort of group trips. You know, people help lift me over rocky sort of pebbles and cobbles to get to this beautiful view in Turkey and I um, when I was living in Spain for four months um, on a voluntary project I was sort of lifted out my chair into a it was a, a van run by like vegetable oil driven by a hippie commune and we went up <laughs> into the mountains and yeah just a really special experience again just sort of going off the beaten track so as my book said everything is possible but it is I think there's a, a leading guy who's passed away now, but he did a lot around accessible tourism, that accessible tour- tourism is adventure tourism. So even when I've gone to better places for wheelchair users, you still end up with the taxi turns up and it's not suitable or mm. yeah, the hotel hasn't got a wet room shower. So even the more safer bets, there's still dramas and, and adventures but you know it makes life interesting and when we were in Las Vegas they messed up the room but the only one they could find that was accessible 
was a proper like penthouse suite. So <laughs> you get you get the upside sometimes. Brilliant. Well. <laughs> I love it. Um, I've just got one more final question for you from a um, guest. 285 has asked, what's your take on social media and the power it has to make uh, the world inclusive? Yeah, so most of all, very good, very positive. Um, you know, the things I wanted to do, even like I've ended up doing BBC Breakfast, writing for The Guardian, being on the radio, like all the mainstream media stuff I dreamt of doing I only got on there because I started blogging and using social media. So that that was another great way of achieving my dreams and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I also feel, you know, we don't actually need the larger gatekeeper media like we used to because I can, on my own blog, on my own social media, I can reach the exact people that I want to hear my message and I want to learn from them and basically build a community. Um, so I, I think it's, it's very, very powerful for this is what it is to live with a disability, how to try and educate uh, people about that, all that kind of stuff. The one thing that I am still trying to crack is the, the downside of social media. It's not just about disability, but there's a bit of echo chamber and we all talk within our own groups where we all sort of agree and I think politically it's been used to divide people a lot. You know, you're, you're either Brexit or you're Stay and you're Trump or you're Clinton. All this political division has been magnified with social media. And so what I want to try and work out is how, if you unified all disabled people, that could sway an election. And that would also be a way of making businesses make radical changes to be more inclusive but it's very difficult to unite a blind community with a deaf community or a wheelchair user community so there's something about how we connect the smaller groups of disability and the same separate to disability um so that's the downside and obviously we all know about trolling and that stuff is you know and the mental health of social media they've all been touched on in the news so i think it's a tool, it's how we use it is the most important, how, what we get out of it. And I certainly had to get a thicker skin from some people that were just a bit you know, a bit negative or a bit nasty, but you quickly learn to realize that they have the problem. And when you don't take it to heart and take it personally, those people tend to stop getting in your way anyway. <laughs> Martin, thank you so much. Honestly, it's been so great chatting with you this morning. You've been absolutely great, uh, Martin Sidley. Um, and uh, if anyone wants to uh, follow him on social media, um, make sure that you do. Uh, check out the Spring Pod social media, and we've got all of his um, apps and uh, socials on there as well. So you've been absolutely great. Thank you so much indeed. Um, it's been an absolute, uh, an absolute honor having you here with us this morning. Um, if you want to donate to the Children's Trust, anyone who's watching, uh, the donation link is on screen now, the childrenstrust.org.uk forward slash donate. As much or as little as you can donate would be absolutely fantastic. And uh, it's a charity for uh, helping uh, rehabilitate children with acquired brain injury. Um, da -da -da, don't forget to tune in to uh, tomorrow's session where we'll be joined by the candidate support specialist and the HR advisor from Nestle, where they'll be sharing their specialist knowledge and advice for what to expect from a virtual assessment center. Um, Martin, good luck with the wedding. I hope uh, you managed to get married uh, within the year and uh, all the best uh, in the future. To everyone who's watching, thank you for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.